morning. Good morning, everybody. We'll just give it a few minutes um, and just uh, allow our guests uh, to just slowly make their way in. Okay, I think we can definitely get started. Um, good morning, um, Dumelang, Sanbonani, um, and welcome uh, to you all this morning. Um, it's really such a great pleasure to have you all here um, joining us again for yet another a, a very exciting um, launch. My name is Lerato Letebele Belandrin, and I am the Head of Communications at the Center for Environmental Rights. Um, and once again, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out um, to join us uh, uh, this morning. I'd like to hand over to my co-host and co-facilitator -facilit um, to introduce herself uh, to us. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Karina Conradi. I am the coordinator of the Life After Coal campaign. Um, and we are so happy to, to have you all with us today. We have really exciting content to present to you and some in incredible speakers who will be presenting uh, the content and the, the lived application of this uh, information to us. Uh, we'd like to encourage all of you to engage on the chat. Please share any information or, or engagements you, you'd like on the chat and keep an eye out for links that we'll be posting there, uh, both of some of the videos that we'll be playing for you and of the reports themselves, um, including some uh, interaction, interactive engagement with the reports. Um, yeah, so on that note, um, I think we're going to uh, launch in um, to our first speaker, um, who will be Professor Nick King. Um, uh, Professor King, uh, if you are ready, and then I will introduce you. Um, we are very lucky to have Professor King with us. Uh, he is an independent consultant in global change, futures visioning, and strategic planning. Uh, Nick has over 25 years experience in the global change environment, biodiversity, policy, planning, and development sectors. His expertise encompasses futures research, global, global change analysis, and in particular, environmental change, including climate change. Uh, so scenarios, development systems, and resilience thinking. Um, we're very grateful to have you here um, and uh, uh, very grateful for the, the work you've put into the report as well. Um, so, Professor King, over to you. Hey, morning. Uh, yeah. So, um, can I just check, we were just discussing this earlier where you said you were changing the program around. Um, yes, our apologies. We're having some trouble getting hold of our first two speakers. Um, so that's a, an unfortunate last minute change in the program again. Um, so if you wouldn't mind going ahead um, while we try to get hold of them, uh, we'd really appreciate that. Um, yep, it's no problem. Um, I do see Francois uh, is on uh, the participants list, however. So if you want to go uh, within as planned that would be fine <laughs> okay. um uh we might have to just see if we can transfer him over to having panelist rights um yeah i think maybe professor king just um because you're ready and we we've got you here um i'm logged in but i can't activate audio um yeah these are the perks of connecting and having um all these important launches happening online. Um, we just have to um, bear with us, please. But maybe Professor King, seeing as you're ready, if we could just go ahead um, with your report and your findings, and um, we'll just try and get um, Professor Francois over to the other side. 
Thank you. Okay, no problem. I'll go into uh, screen sharing. Okay, can you just confirm you can see the slides? It's looking great. Me? Yes, and loud and clear. Okay, great. So, so morning, everybody, and thanks uh, to the CER for this opportunity to uh, share share some thoughts and info. Um, I think we've got a, a little bit of a, a mix up in the sequence right now. So. Um, I'm, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. However, um, this uh, is an expert report commissioned um, as part of the challenge to the 1500 megawatts uh, of uh, coal in the IRP. So that's the context within it. Within. My uh, report was uh, built on an interpretation of a whole series of other reports, and I'll touch on those a little bit to try and interpret what will be the impacts um, on South Africa's youth um, and future generations on the current trajectory uh, that we're on, which is, which is essentially a worst case scenario. So it builds on reports such as the Global Environmental Outlook, of which I was co-chair of the Science and Policy uh, Panel, um, the Global Synthesis uh, Report that was uh, developed for the United Nations General Assembly and launched in February this year by the Secretary General, Making Peace with Nature, which tries to bring all of these together. And the Environmental Management in South Africa, third edition, of which I was the lead editor and also co-author on the chapter on social dimensions of environmental management. So what are the impacts of good versus bad environmental governance on people when we talk about environmental management? So hugely important context there. The IPCC six assessment report, um, which just came out uh, in a month or so ago, um, lots more information there, but also particularly the information for Africa, because now they're producing a regional, a much more regional localized information. So these scenarios, um, 1.5, 2 and 4 degrees C of very, very uh, high and rapid increase in temperatures across particularly Southern Africa for us and a rapid drying of the subcontinent um, with uh, reductions in rainfall here um, going up to about 40%. I'm not gonna to deal too much in any of this because Francois will be doing that uh, around the physical science basis, but just to say, we're looking at uh, the information for West Southern Africa, the block on the left there, and East Southern Africa, which basically encompasses uh, South Africa and the uh, observed and projected climate changes uh, for the country. And so my report will be so, okay, so we, we know all of that information about the physical climate changes that are coming. What does that mean um, for us as society? And what does it mean particularly for future generations? Uh, it also builds on the expert report by Garrett Barnwell, which was uh, also commissioned by the CR and a really good webinar on the 7th um, of September. Uh, where Garrett presented his findings and talked about all of the traumas and stresses which society as a whole um, is, is experiencing and will experience due to climate change, as well as everything else people are dealing with, um, and interpreting that for the youth as well. And then this uh, climate, Children's Climate Risk Index, which came out from UNICEF, also just in the last couple of weeks, uh, which is for the first time the vulnerability and exposure risk for children, and basically they found that about a billion children, about half of the world's children are at the highest, extremely high risk level, the highest risk level of the impacts of the climate crisis. And unpack a little bit of that. So if we look at the increasing exposure to risks uh, worldwide, we're seeing that sort of every 10 years or so, um, the numbers are doubling up in these extreme weather catastrophes. And so the exposures for society and the exposures for children in particular, if these trajectories uh, continue, um, are rising very, very rapidly. We've uh, seen these, what have been called compound events now, so not just isolated incidents that are happening in one place at one time around the world. So uh, more recently, and particularly this year, these multiple extreme events that are happening beyond uh, previous records, records being broken everywhere around the world. And the, the importance about this is just the language that we're seeing starting to come out of here. We are in uncharted territory. We have never seen this many uh, fires concurrently at emergency level. 
that these are virtually unstoppable uh, fires that we had in Australia um, with mass evacuations. And, and that's in a developed country with vastly more resources for things like emergency services. And so the, the anxiety and the trauma for society in less developed countries is ramping up much further. And we saw, for example, in 2019, for the first time on record, two cyclones along southern, cyclones along southern Africa's east coast, a die which displaced uh, about 2.2 million people and virtually destroyed the city of Vira and was followed just a month later by Kenneth um, with significant impacts. And we're going to see more of those and more of those penetrating inland. And we have already had some estimates that climate change is costing South Africa about GDP, 10% of our GDP in terms of things like uh, crop failures, uh, drought relief and so on. And with already high unemployment and particularly amongst youth where it goes up to about 50%, poverty and the lack of service delivery across the country, unless we get some significant change in our development policies, including energy, water, health and so on, climate change will exacerbate these issues. And, and that will really undermining any of the future prospects we currently have for youth in the country. So I want to just quickly uh, interpret the sort of key social effects of these, of these climate impacts, um, dealing with some of the, the headlines of fresh water availability and quality, food security, fire and fire risk, extreme events, their impact on structure, infrastructure and service delivery, particularly those things which uh, enable daily life, energy, transport, water, health, education, and the results in forced migrations as these uh, systems collapse and the emotional well-being um, or trauma that that induces. So we'll dig into each of those a little bit, and there's a lot more detail in the report, and I would really encourage you to please look into that. So when we talk about uh, the impacts on fresh water, South Africa, as I'm sure everyone is aware, is already a semi-arid country. Access to water and sanitation is already highly problematic, um, particularly with things like collapsing uh, municipal uh, sanitation uh, infrastructure. With the rising number and severity of extreme weather events, we'll get more floods, for example, damaging the water infrastructure, affecting the quality and availability, precipitating disease outbreaks, where we get raw sewage, for example, flooding into the Vaal River right now. And we already have problems with poor water quality, where, for example, diarrhea is already the biggest killer of under five-year-olds in South Africa because of waterborne pathogens and untreated water. Um, girls and women, if you are traditionally tasked with fetching water, will have to spend more time sourcing and fetching water as a result. And there are a whole bunch of attendant negatives associated there to for uh, women and, and, and the girls. Missed schooling for the girls, uh, being out of class. There's a lot of insecurity coming uh, involved and risks of violence when girls are out on their own sourcing water um, and other things like firewood. And compromised water access and quality means that food preparation, general hygiene, sanitation all become much more difficult. These affect health, the ability to attend school for children, the ability to learn and develop um, fully when you're ill or having to spend time um, doing other chores. So these impacts of freshwater availability and quality will have significantly impact um, children. And we see going back even uh, more than a decade, the analysis from the United Nations Environment Program, that so Southern Africa will be one of the region's hard hardest hit by water scarcity. So relatively, we're already semi-arid um, and that we're gonna get hotter and drier. And a shortage of water will not only affect economic growth, there may not be enough water for everyone to live on. So we have these fairly dire situations where we're going to have conflict over our water resources. Uh, to the point of just enough for daily survival, daily hygiene, um, and uh, potential conflict with neighboring countries over allocations of water resources. All of this leads to unsettlement, uh, an unsettled environment for children in households um, and in any of the environments that they're working in, such as school. Those compromised water resources lead to compromised food security, um, together with rising temperatures. We know very well about the prolonged droughts we've been experiencing. These are probably going to get longer, uh, hotter temperatures, um, higher wind speeds, reducing plant growing days, um, will make rain-fed, particularly rain-fed cropping impossible. Um, there will also be uh, conflict over irrigation water uh, for agricultural cropping, as opposed to using it for domestic use or industrial use. 
Also, heat stress with rising temperatures will make working outdoors, field labor, uh, agricultural labor simply untenable um, for most of the year and reduced hours, people will be able to do that. And this will have severe uh, consequences for rural livelihoods, for subsistence farmers, but also commercial farmers and all other uh, external uh, workers and laborers. Um, but farming communities are those being hardest hit at the moment um, with the least ability um, to mitigate these impacts. On top of those uh, temperature rises, we'll get extreme events like hailstorms, floods, which will destroy crops and kill livestock. So we've had plenty of examples of those. Uh, water, warmer temperatures will enable greater disease um, functionality and outbreaks on crops and livestock and wildlife, even in game farming. Um, and these will increase and obviously compromise the viability um, of those. So food security will rise. Children will suffer most from hunger and malnutrition, have to spend longer hours assisting with food production and or food procurement. And most especially, this uh, burden falls on girls more than boys, uh, with more and more girls losing out on education and other opportunities for advancement. And thus really um, losing a lot of the, the gains we've made in gender equity over the past couple of decades. Ultimately, large parts of the country will become increasingly uninhabitable because uh, of the lack of water and the compromised uh, food security. And this will lead to highly disruptive forced migrations of communities. And I'll pick up on that in a minute. Fire and fire risks, those uh, similar to semi-arid regions elsewhere, subject to regular fires, uh, particularly Mediterranean regions we've seen around the world. South Africa is already and will certainly experience rapidly increasing probability of these fire risk conditions. Higher temperatures, longer dry periods, greater winds um, <clears throat> in many areas across the country, um, leading to loss of life, infrastructure, and social instability. Informal settlements will be particularly vulnerable. We know this already, but as we get more crowding uh, and, and more vulnerability, less access to water in informal set settlements, so the impacts, uh, the incidents and impacts of fires will ramp up. Children will be very vulnerable to these traumatic disruptive events. Um, we're not just incurring physical injuries, but experiencing the loss of homes, their possessions, disrupted and displaced livelihoods with nowhere to live, the loss of relatives, their potentially parents and siblings and friends, and often death themselves. And living with this daily anxiety of such events uh, in informal set settlements where they're almost a, a daily occurrence uh, sometimes, um, the fear, the helplessness, and the despair um, is highly debilitating, especially for children, when there are no apparent solutions available coming from adults who children depend on and trust to be providing the solutions for these. Infrastructure and extreme events, public service infrastructure such as roads, water and sanitation systems, health, particularly education, particularly electricity, will be continuously damaged by these extreme events and become increasingly costly and unaffordable to repair for a country like South Africa uh, with a very fragile economy um, and to keep having to spend money on repair and replacement. This means that service delivery will almost certainly decline even from the limited service delivery we see today. And the compromised access to electricity, water, health and education services for children will severely disrupt their lives, compromise the ability to get schooling, education, um, and all the other, even recreational amenities, which children should have access to. Certainly private infrastructure, such as houses and businesses and farm buildings will all be damaged by these extreme fire events. This will destroy livelihoods. <clears throat> Disaster relief will be increasingly overstretched as more and more and more people um, are affected and disaster relief will therefore be unable to reach most people, um, leaving them pretty much destitute and no ability to recover from these events. That will again lead to forced migrations um, through a lack of services combined with food insecurity, the loss of the livelihoods and the loss of infrastructure um, disrupting lives. So forced migrations, <clears throat> all of this will collapse people's livelihoods, um, collapse economic status, compromise their physical and mental well-being, leading to much forced migration as people can no longer survive where, where they are in situ. And this will mostly be to informal settlements, which are already compromised situations for people to be living in, uh, with limited service delivery, with uh, very crowded conditions, with uh, sanitation problems, um, lots of conflict, 
Rising levels of forced migration will lead to further social conflict and violence, especially where we get more in migration from countries to the north, which are being subjected to all of the same, and in fact worse, um, in countries in the interior, <clears throat> like Zimbabwe, of these climate impacts, um, leading to a lot of the xenophobic conflicts escalating, which we've seen today. Um, forced migrations will also lead to the loss of spatial and cultural identities uh, for people in the regions where they've grown up, um, moving to these informal settlements in geographic regions, which they have no familiar familiarity with. And this will be especially traumatic for children who, who will be losing everything that is familiar to them, um, often displaced uh, from family units or with single parents, then living with siblings or uh, extended family members. And currently, climate disasters have caused more internal displacement than war um, uh, for one of the first times, with over 30 million people being displaced last, last year globally. And a number of those, a large proportion of those rather, are in Southern Africa, as we mentioned, um, the cyclones in Mozambique. So emotional well-being will be seriously compromised um, through all of these physical, social, economic, and cultural disruptions that people experience. Um, these mental traumas cannot be overstated because they basically will tear apart the social fabrics, even where those are fairly limited, um, that people know about. And UNICEF's child, Children's Climate Risk Index, which I spoke about a little bit earlier, um, rates South Africa's uh, uh, climate risk for children as medium high. That's the lowest for African countries, and we are mentioning the countries north of us are much more um, vulnerable to these climate risks but it's higher than the global medium because South Africa's current development trajectory and fragile economy means that we are very, very vulnerable to these risks and also as a semi-arid country. This increasing inability to cope with climate impacts and the knowledge that government services are overwhelmed and literally unable to help most people will create feelings of abandonment, hopelessness and depression amongst the growing proportion of the population as they feel basically betrayed by those who should be uh, securing their, their safety and their future. And this pertains especially to you, who, who basically see no future prospects as they see the sort of infrastructure around them collapsing and the social services collapsing. Um, and that the adults they depend on and, and trust um, appear fa fail to cope with the situation. So children are gonna be particularly heavily traumatized at these upheavals and the inability of the parents and the adults in general to provide for them and their immediate health and safety and uh, any form of future prospects. So we then took, uh, or I tried to interpret those, those uh, um, <coughs> impacts uh, to three of the uh, localized regions, which have somewhat uh, different characteristics. So one on uh, Malachleni on the High Felt, uh, one in Limpopo, Epilala, and one in the Western Cape. And just tried to unpack those a little bit um, in a bit more detail. There's uh, a, a couple of pages on each of these in the report, but these, these are just the summarized tables. So in Mpumalanga, we already have a lethally high air pollution. Climate change will um, exacerbate these impacts, as uh, uh, these health impacts as heat stress, uh, the inability to work outdoors, the inability to do manual labor um, will be compromised. Um, Agric agriculture will become less productive on the high felt. Uh, water resources are already compromised. Extreme storm events will damage infrastructure, causing mining stoppages, um, as we've already seen with things like <laughs> wet coal. Um, and the diseases that are already prevalent, we will see expand, such as malaria, because of the rising temperature. And all of these will impact on those communities very specifically. Yeah, exacerbating all of the social inequities um, and the compromised health already through polluted water and air pollution on the high health. We'll then see the trauma of the phasing out of coal mining um, and the employment opportunities without any sort of significant dust transition currently in place or uh, visible in the foreseeable future, causing massive unemployment and social upheaval as a result. Rain-fed agriculture is likely to be no longer viable. We'll get increasing severity of storms and potentially massive flooding from this ingress of tropical cyclones from the eastern coast, um, ongoing damage of the infrastructure, um, rising frequency and intensity of fire events, and the collapse of local e economies, um, which will be exacerbated by in-migration from countries to the north with Mpumalanga um, and also Limpopo being closest to the border, 
And all of these will be extremely traumatizing for people living there. And of course, the, the children are at the, bear the brunt at the end of this because adults are, are increasingly unable um, to be, find employment, to provide for their families, there's increasing social conflict, there's increasing health problems, there's an inability to go to school, um, there's an inability to get service delivery. And as we go beyond and temperatures go up, unless we get some significant changes, all of these are going to become uh, more extreme. And essentially we'll find that most of the high felt is going to collapse from an industrial perspective. Um, there'll be no longer uh, readily available agricultural productivity. Um, and people are basically going to find that it's uninhabitable to be on the high felt. In uh, Lepalala and Lepopo, we will see a lot of the similar, similar impacts up there, but because it's further west, um, the temperature extremes are gonna be greater, the compromised access to water resources uh, will be greater, um, the rain-fed agriculture impacts will happen uh, earlier, um, there will be these increases in dramatic heat events, which in themselves uh, will likely cause higher mortalities uh, amongst the most vulnerable, which includes children, but also the elderly infirm and infirm. And also this reduced access to biological resources as these ongoing droughts and rising temperatures change the, the uh, plant compositions in the community. We'll start to see a loss of endemic species and a lot of invasion by invasive species, making even grazing lands um, unsuitable. These impacts will, will uh, rapidly escalate if we get no change um, in climate mitigation. We'll get bush encroachments severely reducing rayland grazing potential. Basically farmlands uh, in Limpopo, uh, even uh, the wildlife and game ranching uh, will become severely uh, compromised and untenable with massive unemployment, um, social disruption and the migration that we were talking about. And then as it goes, uh, it gets hotter and drier in the interior, it basically becomes uninhabitable unless uh, for potentially only very, very wealthy individuals or industry that can afford to adapt to extensive cooling and water infrastructure. But of course the water resources will be severely compromised. So it's unlikely that even that will be able to, uh, to happen. And in the Western Cape and, and coastal regions, you have a somewhat different scenario. Um, you, in, in the oceans, you're going to see marine living resources are fish stocks on which many livelihoods and, and economic opportunities depend are either shifting ranges or dying out, collapsing a lot of, of the uh, fisheries uh, economy. Also the tourism economy that goes with that, scuba diving, whale watching and so on is gonna be severely compromised. Um, the Western Cape drought periods, the Eastern Cape drought periods, uh, we know are, are continuing um, and likely to uh, come back again. This will impact on farming, the, the wine sector in the Cape has already been compromised. This also impacts on tourism, which is a mainstay of the economy. Um, and so the unemployment from these, this economic decline will increase. And also the Cape Floral Kingdom, uh, which is it's co-evolved with that Mediterranean climate envelope in the Western Cape, that envelope is changing. And so we'll get a significant change in the Cape Floral Kingdom, which is also uh, the basis for a lot of the, the tourism for the Western Cape. We'll also see as we go forward uh, with sea level rise, coastal flooding and erosion, We'll see compromised transportation systems along the coastline. We'll see uh, compromised property values um, as we get erosion, uh, shoreline erosion and property damage. Um, insurances will go up and in many cases, uh, properties will become uninsurable. Um, all of this is going to impact hugely on the tourism economy, uh, the agricultural economy, particularly wine growing, the Western side of the Western Cape with the wheat and so on will be compromised. And you're gonna get, continue to have this massive in-migration to the Western Cape as we've seen. Um, and of course, people are going to be uh, forced into more and more and more crowded conditions with higher and higher um, unemployment, but compromised service delivery because uh, the province and the city will just not be able to keep up with that influx of migrants. So educational opportunities, health opportunities, et cetera, uh, will all be compromised. And again, the people bearing the brunt of this or those members of society are the youth and the children um, who are gonna lack the opportunities for any form of uh, self-development um, and be able to try and pull themselves out of these very dire circumstances. So just in conclusion then, um, to say that uh, with the context of this report, 
every additional greenhouse gas emission will exacerbate global heating and the resulting climate impacts uh, on today's youth and all future generations. Without every effort possible to mitigate emissions, the lives of today's youth and future generations will be profoundly negatively impacted, as I hope I've, I've outlined. Those generations are currently being abandoned, basically, by today's adults, uh, the leaders, uh, the people they trust, um, to face um, <clears throat> a severe, from a range of increasingly severe impacts caused by climate change. Their daily lives will be vastly more difficult, quality of life and economic opportunities greatly diminished, and many will suffer premature death from any of extreme weather events, stress, exacerbated disease outbreaks, and all violent social upheaval and conflict, as well as what is becoming increasingly apparent, and Garrett Barnwell's report put on this, is stress-induced suicide uh, with the hopelessness of seeing no future for themselves. So basically, children are suffering the greatest harms. Intergenerational inequity will rapidly increase without a transformational change in our energy policy right now and within a global energy policy, based essentially on no new fossil fuel investments and rapid phase out of all existing fossil fuels. And just to turn the tables on that very, very dire prediction uh, is to say the one thing that we have learned out of this past COVID year is that overnight transformational change is absolutely possible in our society, in the global society. And so what we're talking about here is an equivalent transformational change, which turns the tables on the 20th century generation of energy and all of those updated modes of development and a complete rethinking for the 21st century in order to provide a future, a positive future for today's children and each of the future generations to come after them. Thanks very much. Sure. Thank you so much, um, Professor King. Um, yeah, it's always so difficult to, to hear the stats, to hear the figures, um, as much as we all know um, the reality of what is happening out there. Climate impacts, climate disasters continue to disproportionately affect all people, especially those in the global south. Um, and that's why, you know, as civil society, um, we continue and remain encouraged by, you know, all the action that's being taken, especially by young people um, who are really trying um, to take um, leadership in, in, in tackling this, this issue. So thank you so much, Professor King. Um, for sharing um, those insights with us. Um, and now uh, we definitely have um, Dr. Francois Engelbrecht um, as a panelist, and I'd like to hand over to him um, to tell us more about um, his report titled um, Climate Impact in Southern Africa during the 21st um, century. Um, and of course, you know, we need we do need to mention um, and take note that um, Dr. Francois worked with the the late Professor Robert Schulz on um, this report, who unfortunately um, passed away uh, in April earlier this year. So we would also like to take a moment to honor um, and to respect um, his works. Um, yeah, so, uh, so thank you, Dr. Francois, for being here and presenting um, the work on his behalf. Um, so a little bit about Dr. Francois Engelbrecht um, is a professor of climatology at the Global Change um, Institute uh, at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. He served as an invited lead author of the IPCC's special report on global, global warming um, of 1.5 degrees, uh, which was um, obviously established in um, 2018. And he is currently Still an invited lead author of the Working Group 1 of Assessment Report 6 of the IPCC. Um, so thank you, Dr. Francois, and I'll like to hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Lerato, for the kind introduction, and thank you also for remembering Professor Bob Scholes. At the beginning of this talk, I, I greatly appreciate that. And it is a privilege to share with everybody this, this analysis I've been undertaking with Prof Scholes over the last few months uh, until he passed away. And then, of course, I continued beyond that. Um, I'm just now facing the next technical challenge, which is sharing my screen. Yes. Just, uh, <laughs> just hanging everybody. I, I'm supposed to be such an experienced Zoomer. 
but I um, think I, I yeah, think I'll no, be every every Zoom session has its own challenges. <laughs> looks like it at least today I have all appeared at the same time. Okay, let me try again. Um, we're looking at your emails currently. Maybe you can just stop share. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's not that's not good. Click away, everybody. <laughs> Look away. <laughs> While I am, um, oh, so I should do this. That's the problem. I have in some way started sharing. Oh, there I am. Okay. Okay, second attempt. Just your PowerPoint prop. <laughs> yes. Okay, I still can't find that. Just a second. Let me close a few more windows. Uh, if it's easier, Prof, uh, you can also email it to one of us and we can share if, if you're having difficulty. Let me make one more attempt. Sure. Okay, I think we are in business. Confirmed, oh, yes. someone? Yes. Perfect, okay. thank you. Apologies for the delay, everybody. So I am going to um, talk reasonably briefly. I think um, Professor King gave now a broad overview of climate change impact in our region. I think Ian, I planned initially to present in the opposite order, in the reverse order. So what I'm going to talk about now is, um, is effectively an overview of where we are standing as we are meeting today in terms of the state of global warming and climate change globally and in South Africa. Of course, I will also be talking about the main risks we will be facing into the future. So let me jump in immediately and um, Remind everybody that is uh, about assessment report six of the IPCC, which have been published in August this year. Uh, you must have seen the reporting in the media. The report is now being regarded as a code red for humanity. For two reasons mainly. Firstly, there are aspects of global warming and climate change that are happening faster than we've anticipated. And secondly, the report is also very clear that our window to do anything about this is closing. And in the coming slides, I will be giving you more details on all of this. So let me start by showing you this first main uh, result from IPCC. Um, it shows on the left-hand side, the degrees of global warming uh, or, or the, the degree of global warming measured in degrees Celsius. And on the right-hand side, you can see global warming is in fact, of course, projected to happen as a function of what we are going to do as humans in terms of greenhouse gas mitigation. So if you look there on the right-hand side, the scenario at the top, shared socioeconomic pathway, 5, 8.5, that's of course a fossil fuel based future. Uh, and if we are going to continue uh, fueling the world's economy with fossil fuels through the 21st century, then climate models are indicating that global warming will reach values close to five degrees Celsius by the end of the century. On the other hand, if we make a best effort mitigation uh, across the world over the next few decades, SSP 1, 1 1.9 there at the bottom, then there's still a chance that we can restrict global warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, in the context of this slide, two more, important find, two more important findings from IPCC. One, global warming has now reached a value of 1.1 degrees Celsius. That's our best estimate for global warming up until today. Um, secondly, the 
projections for that scenario at the bottom, our best effort that we can possibly make, SSP 1, 1 1.9, that's a future where emissions are halved by 2030. So these are rapid cuts happening immediately over the next 10 years, achieving a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2050. Even for that effort, the report has assessed that it is more likely than not that we will be exceeding the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. And that exceedance may happen as early as the early 2030s. That's currently the best estimate available. The good news is for that best effort mitigation effort, the chances are excellent that global warming will be restricted to below two degrees Celsius. So let's interrogate all of this a bit more. Um, in the report, great detail is of course provided in terms of how these different scenarios into the future look like in terms of future carbon dioxide emissions and also the emissions of other greenhouse gases. So yeah, at the top in this graphic, you can see a future that remains dependent on fossil fuels as the main source of energy through the 21st century. And then yeah, at the lower, this light blue line, you can see the opposite type of future world where there are massive cuts in emissions starting immediately with net zero carbon dioxide emissions achieved around about 2050. So everybody, these are of course, extremely different, completely diverse possible futures. And as we are meeting here today, it is still humanity's choice, which pathway we will be taking. Now, if we want to avoid these most dangerous impacts of climate change, which are defined by 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of global warming or higher levels of global warming, what should we do? Um, a few slides from now, I will just also remind everybody again of why 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold is thought to be a dangerous threshold of global warming. But for now, in this slide, what, what needs to be done globally? to avoid that temperature threshold being exceeded. Well, um, there are many analyses out there today, but I think an important one came from the International Energy Agency a couple of months ago. And their estimation is that we will need an annual, annual investment in alternative forms of energy, mostly renewables, in the order of about 5 trillion US dollars um, constantly from 2030 towards 2050 to achieve that net zero emissions reduction target by 2050. Other estimates are very similar. The IPCC itself in its 2018 special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, assessed that one would need about 130 trillion US dollars between now and 2050 to facilitate that conversion away from fossil fuel energy generation to renewable energy generation. So these are massive investments and they may well of course be costs to economies on the short term. But overall the International Energy Agency estimated that this investment in renewables may, re may well result in, uh, in adding about a 0.4% growth to the annual GDP, global GDP, and uh, during this period of the transition. So there are also immense economic opportunities, of course, in pursuing this transition. And then other important recommendations from the International Energy Agency is, is that um, the steps that need to be taken immediately is for a start to, to immediately stop all new gas and oil projects. Um, that's true for coal. Coal is not even mentioned. That's just assumed, of course, that coal is no longer part of the mix. So no further projects in gas, oil, coal. Um, then the other sector that will transition very rapidly is the expectation is, of course, the electric transport industry. 
So the International Energy Agency recommends that there should be no further sales of new internal combustion passenger cars as early as 2035. Think a little bit about what that may mean for South Africa. Um, so in their estimate, 70% of electricity generation must be renewable by 2050. And they argue that the other 50% should be nuclear energy. So in, in the analysis of the International Energy Agency, they, they, they think, or their assessment is that because we've delayed so much the mitigation effort, the growth in the renewable sector alone will now not be sufficient to provide in the energy mix by 2050. And, and, and the fraction of nuclear energy will also be needed. So that's another interesting point to ponder. What's happening right now? Um, I think everybody in this call is aware of the 26th conference of the parties coming up at the beginning of November. And I still want to be positive today and make a prediction that we will see at the end of this meeting, the most powerful pact we've ever seen in terms of climate action. So I think it is quite clear that the, the host of the meeting, the UK, the United States, South Korea, Japan, and the European Union at least, will be making commitments of net zero emissions by 2050 and more or less halving the emissions by 2030. Now that alone is going to swing. Um, investments in renewables, the, the, the momentum of investment in renewables will, I think, after this COP, be bigger than it has ever been. And then, of course, just in the last week or so, a very major policy, policy shift from China, saying that it will no longer fund any coal-based projects abroad, which is also an important development ahead of the meeting. So, of course, um, I think we are all nervous to see to what extent the USA and China will be able to collaborate on these key issues. Um, but I think, especially over the last week or two, the, it has become more positive again, the, the outlook of, of some success at this important COP. So a few more slides on what we can expect globally and in the world if the, if the mitigation effort is successful versus if it is not successful. And with these slides, I would also like just to remind everybody again why 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of global warming are regarded as dangerous thresholds of global warming. So the top left slide we've spoken about, at the top right, you can see projected changes in precipitation over the world's continents. And you can see that in a warmer world, because there is more moisture in the atmosphere, on the average, the continents are projected to become generally wetter. And that comes with the risk of more extreme weather events, as we've seen in the European floods of July, specifically the floods in Germany. But our region is an exception, as I will soon show. We are one of the few parts in, of the world, one of the few land areas that are not projected to become wetter. Sea ice, Arctic sea ice, um, we are going to lose that precious ecosystem under low mitigation completely by more or less the middle of the century. The Arctic Ocean will be completely ice free by the end of the Northern Hemisphere summers. Um, so that's another uh, clear fingerprint of climate change. And then of course, sea level rise, the right hand slide, under low mitigation futures, we are looking at sea level rise in the order of a meter by the end of the century, uh, in the order of half a meter if mitigation is successful. Now that meter sea level rise um, is of course sufficient to displace hundreds of millions of people, just looking at today's population from where they are currently living. But the real reason why these temperature thresholds are thought to be dangerous is because they define what is known as tipping points, global tipping points in the Earth system. So this report assesses that the possibility exists that between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, we may trigger the irreversible melting of both the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets. 
Now that is that means sea level rise of about 12 meters. We don't understand exactly how fast the ice sheets will melt. It, it really should be, it should take millennia. So this is not something that's going to happen in our lifetimes. But remember a meter of sea level rise in the century will already have devastating impacts. The estimate is that under these low mitigation futures, we are looking at six meters of sea level rise over the next 2000 years, which means our generation is committing future generations to a different planet, a different coastline, a smaller planet, one can say, with less living space. So now, what about our region? Um, I think um, Prof King already mentioned several of the important aspects. The, maybe the, the number one thing to point out for our region is that it is warming rapidly. In the four maps there at the top, we are looking at warming in different parts of the world as a function of the level of global warming. So top left, how, how do different parts of the world warm, by the uh, warm uh, when the world on the average has warmed by 1.5 degrees Celsius? And you can see in the southern hemisphere, you don't have to look any further than our region, southern Africa, for the place that is warming up the fastest. And um, once we reach levels of three and four degrees Celsius of global warming, um, regional climate change can only be described as devastating. And I think Prof King pointed out uh, what the consequences may be. But for a start, the IPCC assessed in its 2018 report that by the time that the world has warmed by three degrees Celsius globally, the maize crop as well as the cattle industry in Southern Africa are likely to collapse. And that's because the regional temperature increases then in the order of six degrees Celsius. And then combined with the heat wave impacts, just the heat stress on its own is enough to bring the collapse of these two critical sectors of our agriculture. And it's already happening. Let's all remember that climate change is not something of the future. I don't think I have to say it to this audience. The fingerprints are all around us already. In our own region, it's already about two degrees Celsius warmer than what it is supposed to be. So over the last several decades, our region has, has warmed by almost uh, well, a, a little bit more in some locations, but in the order of two degrees Celsius over the last century. So that means roughly at a rate of twice the global rate of warming. And then the, the last important part of our climate change narrative um, from the physical science based perspective before I start to conclude. Um, what about rainfall? So I have these. This slide, the next one on rainfall events. The most important message is that our region is likely to become generally drier. Now the IPCC reports, a report of August this year also points out that this drying trend can already be detected. And you can see as the global warming level increases, the strength of the regional drying also increases. And it is that combination of our region becoming generally drier in combination with at the same time becoming drastically warmer that makes us so vulnerable. That is what makes us a climate change hotspot. Remember, if you are living in the Northern Hemisphere continent in a climate in the high latitudes that say European climate or North European climate, um, it is typically a climate that is cool and wet. Now it's becoming warmer and wetter. There are risks. But you can, you can adapt to that type of change to a large extent. In our region, we are already so water stressed just naturally because of our natural climate. Now this water stressed region is becoming drier and hot. And it means our, our options for, for adaptation are far more limited than in the Northern Hemisphere high latitude land region. Now, the IPCC makes a final important assessment for our region, and I'll, I'll just mention that before I will conclude. Um, despite the fact that the region is projected to become generally drier, in the eastern parts of Southern Africa, 
extreme rainfall events are projected to be increasing in a warmer climate. And part of that narrative is the more frequent landfall of tropical cyclones, and I should say specifically intense tropical cyclones, over Mozambique and potentially further to the south, over the northeastern parts of South Africa. Now, let me remind everybody that when tropical cyclone Idai made landfall on the 14th of March, 2019, it brought the biggest, uh, 2018, it brought the single biggest flood disaster to our region in the historical record. Uh, more than 1,300 people lost their lives in the path of that cyclone, completely unprecedented in terms of impact. Now, the, the science in the IPCC report is so clear. In a warmer world, there's more moisture in the atmosphere. The cyclones can get more energy from the warm ocean surface and from the moisture within the system. And category three to category five cyclones are likely to start occurring more frequently across most of the world's ocean basins. And such a change can already be detected. Um, I don't think we are prepared in our region for category four of category five hurricanes making landfall, especially if we look to the south at Maputo, Richards Bay, or the Limpopo River Basin in South Africa. So um, to conclude, oh, I have this one more slide. Let me just say that um, all these changes in temperature and, and precipitation that I've discussed, and uh, the mechanisms causing these are very well understood. And that, of course, raises the confidence we have in these projections. But in this specific slide, you can just see a uh, projected change in the westerly winds over the Southern Ocean. And the slide is just telling us that as the world gets warmer, the cold fronts are being shifted increasingly towards the South Pole. And that is, of course, also increasingly robbing us from our winter rainfall in Southern Africa. So now for those conclusions. Um, it's not the, the topic of my talk today, but I think as many of you will know, um, climate change mitigation, if it is to be pursued aggressively globally, and I think all the signs are there that it's happening and it will increasingly so after COP26, brings big risks to us in South Africa. If we are not going to transition, the risk of stranded assets are becoming bigger and bigger over time. I would say that our Mdupe power plant, our Kassili power plant, these, these are already to some extent standard assets. I don't think we will see them in operation until 2060 as per the original plan. The international pressure to get out of coal will be so tremendous that, that we will phase them out much sooner. Now, the longer that we resist the transition and the longer that we don't aggressively pursue the, the transition, the bigger these risks become in terms of standard assets. Uh, on the other hand, there are tremendous opportunities if we pursue the transition aggressively and we are part of the solution, we are entitled to, under the principles of climate justice and the just transition, we are entitled as a developing country to tremendous financial support, cheap loans, investment, green, fly, green climate fund transfers for big just transition projects in South Africa. So that's a big choice we have to make. But my talk today is more about the risks we are facing. So let me point out that if the world is not going to make the transition fast enough, um, our temperatures will, of course, continue to rise. Um, even if the world is successful in restricting global warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, we should remember that in the regional Southern Africa, that means more than 3 degrees Celsius of regional warming. So we are committed to further impacts. And with that increase in average temperature comes more extreme weather events, more high fire danger days, more heat wave days with impacts on agriculture and on human health. Um, but Prof King has, has spoken about this in some detail. Let me conclude by pointing out to you what I think is our biggest single climate change risk over the next 20 years the near term as the IPCC calls it. I think it's about day zero droughts occurring more frequently in our region. So the recent report is quite clear that should we warm the earth 
to a new level of global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, the risk of drought will increase further in our region. Now, droughts that last for three to six years at an end, they are the dangerous types of droughts that can cause our cities to face major crises in terms of water supply. They zero events effectively. So the science is very clear that as the world continues to warm, even between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, the risk for multi-year droughts will be bigger in our southern cities, including Cape Town. So the risk of more day zero events will be increasing further. And this is also true for the Gauteng province. And I think that's what too, too few people realize. Um, I won't go into the details now, but at the end of the big El Nino drought in 2016, Gauteng was in fact very close to a day zero type drought because the vol dams level was below 25%. Now, climate science is very clear. In a warmer world, the risk for these multi-year droughts that bring day zero events to our cities is increasing. And that's also true for our Eastern mega dams. And therefore it's also true for Gauteng. And then finally, let us not forget that although the region is, is becoming systematically warmer and drier, extreme weather events, specifically extreme rainfall, is also a risk that will increase in the future. The most dangerous of all of these is the possibility of a category three to five hurricane, making it further to the south than ever before and making landfall at Maputo or Richards Bay. That is another climate risk. I think we are not prepared for at all in our region. Um, with that, Leratu, I, I'm handing back to you and I hope there will be some time for discussion later on in our session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Engelbrecht. Uh, uh, you have actually handed over to Karina. Um, <laughs> sure, sure, Karina. Okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> So thank you so much for, for all of your input. Um, I think it's clear that there's both a lot for us to be fearful of, but also vitally a lot to give us hope. Um, and I think for many of us, much of that hope lies in our climate movements and specifically in our youth movements. Um, we're very lucky today to have a speaker from the African Climate Alliance, one of our leading youth climate movements in South Africa. You might have seen them this past Friday at Parliament uh, as part of the global climate strikes. Uh, and we'll now just be playing a short clip to introduce the youth climate movement. Uh, but before I hand over to Noni to play that, I just wanted to check Yola. Uh, do you want to say hello just so we can check your sound? Hello. Hi, Yola. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, we're going to play this quick clip and then we will hand over to Yola. Climate change, environmental breakdown, health, economic impacts. These are all things that will come forward and has happened with our reliance on fossil fuels. We need a transition away from fossil fuels, from coal, from gas. Without a healthy environment, we really don't have the ability to survive. And so essentially every right of the youth is at stake for both present youth and youth of the future. We need government to realize us as change makers. They need to listen to us when we tell them to prioritize us and prioritize our futures. We as youth may be called the leaders of tomorrow, but we are taking action today. As a grassroots youth-led organization, we at African Climate Alliance support and understand the need for a Green New Eskom campaign because we believe that it is one of the many steps toward a progressive future. The answer isn't it just transition. To a certain extent, guarantee jobs for the youth of today. Fantastic, thank you so much. So just to introduce Yola, um, uh, yeah, our next speaker will be Yola Ngogwana. And at 14, Yola has already had a long life as a climate activist. She began volunteering with the Earth Child Project at the start of 2019. Uh, where she worked to increase access to environmental education in communities and classrooms around Cape Town. 
and she's gone on to be an active presenter in schools and at African Climate Alliance events. She's a youth ambassador, ambassador with the ACA and marched, marched to parliament with the youth climate strike in 2019, where she addressed over 2000 youth who were gathered at the march. This past Friday, she also joined the global climate strike and again addressed those who were gathered. She's a prominent leader in South Africa's youth climate movements who are bringing hope to our environmental justice struggles. And we're very lucky to have her with us today. Thank you so much, Yola. Over to you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Yolam Kukwanam. I'm a young climate activist and an African Climate Alliance ambassador. As a young person, I should not have to worry about being an activist. I should be living my life, going to school, being with friends, but instead, like many, I have to fight for my future. The older generation had ripped an irreparable hole in the older men, yet we are the ones who are facing the most impact, especially for children like me that live in marginalized communities. And on top of that, we are not taken seriously by the government and decision makers. Currently in Kelly Jump, brains are blocked and we are literally swimming in sewage. I already fetch water from a coconut tap and use the bucket system, which leave me and people like me exposed to dangers and gender-based violence. Clearly the system is broken. Which child would like to live in an environment like that? Our voices are made smaller or use the tokens, but we are not the tokens. We are taking action today and all days to come. We are here today because it is time that we see that our system is broken, that there is corruption in people who are refusing to take action for our now and our tomorrow. It is time that we end to fossil fuels and move to renewables. It is time we take on this change with everyone at the table, with everyone voices paid attention to. No longer will we let those in power put profit over people. We are deserving of a just future and those in power will hear our call. It is time for our leaders and decision makers to take action for my future and the future of my generation and generations to come. We need justice today. It's time we uproot the system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yola, for your, for your inputs. Um, I'm going to hand back to Lerato, who will introduce our next speaker with a video as well. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. And um, thank you, Yola. I think we were having a little bit of a um, sound issue there so um, we will certainly uh, resurface um, this webinar and uh, hopefully people can um, tune in to um, your talk again Yola but thank you so much really great to always have the youth join us um, for these events um, and now of course uh, we continue to hear um, you know from speakers on, on lived experiences um, we'd like to hand over now to our next guest who is Ronald Mklagaza Ronald is the Secretary of Bugani Environmental Justice Movement in Action. Um, born and bred in Emalacheni, uh, Ronald definitely has seen and experienced uh, firsthand, um, you know, the impact uh, of, of coal. Um, this and uh, the learning about um, in his environment, uh, this and um, his lived experiences have basically inspired him um, to uh, get more involved in learning more about um, climate change um, and the fight against um, further climate Im impact. So I would like to hand over over to you, please, um, Ronald. I know you probably won't be joining us via video, but just with your audio, but hopefully we can hear you um, clearly. Over to you, Ronald. Okay, thank you, uh, Everybody, I think everybody can hear me. 
Yes, we okay. can hear so, you. Thanks, Ronald. Uh, okay, thank you, Lerato. Uh, uh, hi, guys. As Lerato just said, I'm Ronald Mtagaza. I'm based here in Malastin, and I grew up here. I was born and bred here. So the issues that we are facing uh, here at Malashini. Uh, more or less that I can say uh, on health issues because we are surrounded by coal mines, coal uh, fire power stations. And uh, most of the people, uh, they are sick and uh, such as uh, asthma, sinuses, TB, and chronic disease. And Abantuana, Mabavela, Bavela Sebakula, and and Abazala, Basibins. And uh, the, the medical bill is too uh, expensive. They cannot even take their children to, 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 to the doctors and uh, to the, or to the specialists because of, uh, they are not working, they are unemployed, but they are staying uh, uh, around a uh, Malachin whereby there is uh, uh, coal mines around uh, Malachin and we have uh, 12 uh, coal power stations around us. So that is a, a challenge that you are experiencing and uh, as we are staying at Amalathin. And another thing that we are facing, if uh, we are we are Pfumula, uh, as much as we know, uh, because a uh, power station, uh, they are polluting each and every day. And uh, uh, even coal, power, uh, coal mines, when they are blasting, and uh, obviously they are, they, they, the blasting uh, material that they are using, uh, it's, 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 it's got uh, chemicals in it. So we are experiencing a, a lot of uh, a negative impact uh, in So even the water that we are drinking, it's not a health water because when you open the taps, uh, the drinking water is not okay. Everyone, everybody who lives in Malashin, uh, we, we buy drinking water. Uh, and as, as well as, as, as I just said, that we are not working. So we have to buy water in order to drink that water, because we cannot drink that water, not unless uh, you, you boil that water and, and uh, drink that water, but it's not safe for you to drink that water. So we are facing the, those challenges in Malachin. So uh, we are fighting to, 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 to see positive results from our municipality and our government. Uh, we are trying to work with them and, and tell them our, our, our stories and our problems that we are facing. So that is a problem that we are facing. And now, and now we, are, we, are, we are fighting with uh, the mines uh, containing the water that we are drinking because the streams are not okay. And uh, as we know, as we know, uh, as we know, uh, mines, they, they, they demand a lot of water and coal power station, they use a lot of water uh, so that is the problem that we are facing. And uh, on the other side of the electricity, we have electricity, but we have a problem of uh, the electricity is too expensive for us as, as the communities. We cannot afford uh, the electricity. It's too expensive. As, as, as I've just said, that uh, most of the people, they are unemployed. Um, they are at home. Uh, the electricity is too expensive. And when they come, and do the, the development and put the, the, the electricity on. They don't ask to the people to do uh, the right, uh, follow the right channels of uh, consulting with the community and hear from the community, what do they say uh, about the, 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 the development? They are just doing it just for them, not only asking for people, uh, what, what do they think about the, 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 the development? And the electricity is too expensive, that is why I'm saying we cannot afford it. And as, as it's expensive as now, uh, I'm thinking of how do, how, how do it be uh, 10 years to come or 15 years to come, which means it's gonna, we're gonna have a problem of the electricity. So I think the alternative is gonna work and it's gonna be fine uh, of just transition because that one is gonna be fair to everyone and we're gonna be agree on that one. And we're gonna be a part in the, of the, of the or, um, of the planning of, 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 the, of the just transition. So that is a problem that we are facing. We are living at Malasheni, where, as I just said, we have 12 uh, power, coal power station, but the problem uh, we are facing uh, load shading. Every time we have a load shading, there's no electricity, 
and you, you don't have to ask, you, you, you will never know who to ask uh, about that problem. So we're experiencing those problems that we're experiencing in Malachin, and we don't have anyone to, 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 to tell about those uh, issues. Uh, even our municipality, they don't come back to us and give the report uh, what is the problem and what is the causes of those uh, challenges that they are having. Um, that is the problem that we are facing at Emalashene and the high uh, uh, unemployment rate here at Emalashene, but too we have a, a coal power station, coal mines, other mines now they are closing down. And, and we have a lot of population uh, squatter camps and uh, those people who are here, they are not a born and bred here at Emalashene. They come to, to, to looking for a job and now the, the, the level of crime is increases, obviously, because now the, 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 the job is finished, the mines are closing. So these people know they cannot go back at their homes. Others, they are going back at their homes, who have homes at, at their, or where they come from, at back to, their, to go back to their families. Uh, but others, they are staying behind. So the population now, we are overpopulating now in the Malachian, whereas there is no other, there, there is no jobs, and there is no other alternative of those people who are already working. And, and other industries, they are closed down, and they are still there. And uh, there is no rehabilitation on those old mines, they are still there. And now you will find out that there is uh, illegal uh, miners now, as they call them Zamazamas. So now you will you'll see the uh, shooting, uh, they are fighting over that uh, uh, piece of mine. Uh, that is the problem that we are facing. So another thing that uh, we are facing uh, on the climate change side, uh, I think uh, we're having a problem on it. Uh, we are experiencing uh, that issue now here at Emalase because now the heat we are heating is uh, I don't know when because uh, of, of of climate change. So. We have that, and now we are experiencing the drought, even though there is no there is no floods. Uh, we are, we didn't experience that so for for now, but I'm 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 I'm, I'm fearing of the maybe ten years or five years to come we'll be experiencing that uh, problem that other uh, countries or other provinces they are experiencing of floods and hurricanes or uh, so, so some of, of of sorts, but here at the Malasian we are facing uh, droughts water scarcity, uh, other people now, other places, other areas, they don't have water. So now our municipality have to take over uh, um, uh, exporting that water to those people, to reach those people, then they, they cannot reach all of them. So that is a problem that we are facing on the climate change side. So even our ozone layer, I think now, if we are experiencing that, it's, 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 it's getting weaker day by day because of, 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 of the, of the uh, emission standard that the the, the the ESCOM and the mining that they are they, they are they are releasing each and every day. So, I, uh, at Impumalanga, it's not a place to stay in because it's not a, it's not getting a, a, a better. It's getting worse each and every day. So, uh, I think uh, that, is, that 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 was my my experience in Lerato. I think I'm done now. If there's any question, then I'll I'll answer. No problem. Thank you, Lerato. Ronald, um, thank you so much. And I believe we actually have um, Promise Mabilo who would also like to um, give us a few words. Promise, are you here with us? Promise Mabilo, who is also- Yes, um, Hi, Promise, thank you. I know you- um, Yes, <laughs> I'm here. Go ahead, Promise, you wanted to share some words with us? Yes, Lerato. Ubufunugu, share us something, Nati, Promise? Yes. Umakuluma, if you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, Lerato. Okay. 
Okay, promise. Maybe we'll just come back to you. Let's let's just wait see if um your your network um just catches up there. Maybe in the meantime, we'd actually like to uh, play another short clip, another short video with you, um which was uh, also just a collection of um stories um we were collecting for our deadly. I'm AKs. back. I'm Lerato. Hi, promise. Yeah, uh, my network is not stable here, but now I'm back. Did you want to just share something quickly with us before we go to the video? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, also, uh, first thing first, I would like to thank uh, the youth um, who, who presented here first. It, it is very nice to see that a young people are more engaging and interested in to be leaders of the campaigns of the climate change that we are facing. As much as we are facing the climate change crisis around um, our country yet, uh, the fear part is that uh, we see no um, involvement of uh, our government maybe coming to the communities to talk about the climate crisis uh, that we have, especially around here in Emalatleni, as we are surrounded with a lot of mines and cold fired power stations. It is very hard and sad that um, least organizations are trying to raise awareness, but we, we, we we as organizations on the ground, we don't see uh, this much uh, force to the government to say, uh, to speak up, uh, to stand for, for what they have to, like for instance, mobilizing and coming to the communities, making sure that the youth is getting involved in these issues. So it becomes very hard. And we see that in the health system, in more cases that when we have um, meetings where, where we get that with the government, but we find that um, most of uh, the people who are more to be more engaging with the issues that we are facing concerning climate change, especially on health issues. On the health issues, we see that um, the Department of Health is not that much involved in most areas where they can maybe share to see that we are getting ready for the impacts of health that will be taking place when um, the climate change hits harder in our different places. So it becomes very hard. As Ronald uh, did uh, state that, um, the, in the case of electricity also, we, 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 we are having a, a, a very big crisis and, and we are one part engaging in most of the time, but we, we don't be in the sense of gathering with those who are in power or those who have to change and make sure that we, we force to the just transition to a, a clean energy to make sure that people start early to adapt to the system that we are trying to get into. So it, it, it becomes very hard for us, but we also see that the climate crisis now is becoming more and more and more visible in our grounds. Thank you. <laughs> no, sis prom or kulumieto, you can put yourself on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, if anybody knows Promise, you will know how passionate she is about this work. Um, and I have shared an article there that uh, will tell you more about the work that Promise as um, as well as them the, and them um, have been doing uh, in Imalacheni. So a huge thank you to both you, Promise, 
and to you, Budroni, for sharing your experiences with us. We remain uh, very encouraged um, by all the hard work you're doing there in Emalacheni. Um, we know that you know things are not easy for you that side, but you know we remain inspired um, and encouraged by by all your your efforts. Um, and so now I would definitely like to hand over um, to that very short clip uh, that we had promised you earlier, which is also you know another video of an testimonies that we collected um, during the deadly air case, which of course we are still waiting um, the judgment on that. So um, if we could play the video, please. Um, Ushala in the a a polluted ganja in a big tile one mean a good thing, even with a similar thing is a man because, like, you get to Laguna Mines, ne? and like, ba the more perfumula loma lo only like your lungs, gal moshe and anan. Um, twenty ten, when I was diagnosed with asthma. So, I'm very like participate in sports, things like the everyday things in the world, because being Valega, not cool when the next. Okay, we know by applicant, dear Lana, but we should like share a store some very distinct air pollution. Yes, affects like if my mother is on a medical aid or a clinic is accepted now because we feel it, there's nothing in my sister. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, and really thank you to um, uh, all our community members out there who are fighting the good fight. Um, and most importantly, who continue to share their stories um, with us. Um, we know it's not easy. Um, it's definitely a challenge. But like I said earlier, we, we remain inspired um, by all the hard work you're doing out there. And so um, now we're going to have a quick Q&A uh, session. I think I'm going to open it up here with one question um, for Professor Engelbrecht. You know, if you could explain to us, um, you know, why is it that South Africa is actually warming at twice uh, the global rate? Yes, so that's, of course, a very important question for our region, and it has everything to do with our very unique climate system in the subtropical part of the world. So it turns out that, as you may have seen on those maps I've shown, that as the world is getting warmer, the tropical parts of the planet get wetter. And that's simply because in a warmer world, there's more big rising air currents and convection, we say, in climate science in the tropics. The tropics get generally wetter, but what happens on planet Earth is that all the air that rises in the tropics must sink eventually. And because of Earth, Earth's rotation, it works out in such a way that all the air that rises in the tropics sinks in the subtropics directly over us. So that is why we are naturally a dry region. But now as we warm the planet, that entire process becomes more vigorous and there's even more sinking air over Southern Africa. And what then happens in the end is we, the sinking air forms big high pressure systems more frequently. And those big high pressure systems, they of course suppress cloud formation. And at the same time, they are preventing cold fronts from the Southern Ocean to move into Southern Africa. And of course, if there is less cloud cover available, more and more sunlight can reach the surface contributing to this accelerated warming of the surface in the subtropical parts of the world. So the, the reasons are in fact quite well understood of why temperatures are rising so rapidly in the Southern African region. And the last thing I can say is then unfortunately, as global warming continues, so will regional warming. And that regional warming will always be happening at a higher rate in Southern Africa than it will happen globally. 
And I think as Prof King and myself pointed out in our talks, these increasing temperatures bring a large number of risks to our region in terms of climate change impacts. Thank you so much, Professor Engelbrecht. Um, I'd like to just invite all of our attendees now as well, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand if you'd like to ask them in person. We're having a fantastic engagement uh, on the Q&A as well. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who's been asking questions and to everyone who's been answering them there, uh, especially Professor King. Um, but yes, we'd like to invite anyone to, to ask questions in person at this point. So please raise your hand, the little um, button with a hand like this at the bottom of your screen if you have a question to ask. Um, in the meantime, maybe I can uh, address uh, or direct your attention to some of the questions in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if uh, perhaps um, uh, Professor King, you want to just speak to, to one of the questions um, that you have answered there um, a bit more in person. I see that there uh, is a particular question there that where, where there's been uh, some good engagement around um, planting trees as a mitigating um, uh, strategy. Um, maybe we could hand over to you, Solang. Yeah, sure. Um I think the question was specifically around planting trees in urban environments. Uh, that is a good idea. Um, urban heat islands are going to get worse. Our cities are going to get very, very warm and, and unlivable. Um, so greening up those cities is, is a really good idea. However, you need to make sure that you're planting with uh, local trees, indigenous trees uh, from that region. Otherwise, you're causing all sorts of biodiversity problems. So this penchant, for example, to uh, plant uh, fever trees, um, you know, acacia trees all over the place is, is just madness. Um, they don't occur uh, south of about Shishlui, um, on, on in Kuzumin South. So, so it is a good uh, approach. It is one thing that people can do. They can plant up in their gardens. Uh, municipalities can do it, cities can do it and so on, but it does need to be done in the right way. The flip side of that is that this idea, uh, which, is, which is very much a sort of Northern perspective that you can plant up vast swathes of sort of Africa and, and South America with monoculture tree plantations is not a solution. That's a maladaptation. Um, there's no real areas which aren't either, which have people, people live on them, people's lands, um, or they are protected areas. Um, and you can't plant monoculture trees to absorb greenhouse gases emitted from the North essentially when people are trying to grow food there. So you've got to be really, really careful about the approach that's taken here. There are, there are no silver bullets in these solutions, believe me. We, it's 250 years of industrialization, which we need to reverse uh, or, or, and turn on its head. We're not gonna do it with a single simple solution, but it needs everybody to come together to bring all of those different solutions together. So not just planting trees, but habitat restoration, catchment restoration with indigenous vegetation. Those are all really, really good solutions, but it does need to be done properly. It does need to be done on good sound ecological principles. Uh, it cannot be done by dispossessing people of their land um, it cannot be done uh, in a sense to sop up greenhouse gas emissions from the north, which basically just allows them to keep uh, emitting greenhouse gases. So uh, we, we do need to be careful in the way that we actually apply uh, the, the sort of greening of the planet. Um, and Professor, just while we've got you, I mean, in your report, you make it very clear um, that these climate changes are not going to arrive in so in some far and distant future. Um, but, uh, you know, would it be correct to say these changes would be apparent in the next five to 10 years? Um, and given that very short time frame and period that we have, what should we be doing? Um, what should be the various um, sectors and pockets of society really be doing um, to ensure that the next five, 10 years does not look um, as bad <laughs> as all these facts and, um, and figures tell us? Rata, yeah, look, I think we need to be very, very clear that this is all already happening. Uh, you know, we, we now have sort of 30 years of evidence since our, our sort of best climate models in the, in the 1980s or so. You know, Cape Town's day zero, uh, the drought across the rest of the country, the two cyclones in one season, Mozambique, 
Um, these are all manifestations of climate change. So they are already happening. We are already experiencing them. Our community activists who have just been speaking promise and that are telling you that they're experiencing it every single day. Uh, people who obviously live in urbanized environments are able to sort of ward off a bit uh, of the impacts, but people who live um, on the landscape, sustainable uh, subsistence farming are, are being driven off the land. So we, we mustn't believe that it's only something coming in the future. It is happening. It's happening right now. It's going to get worse. It is getting worse. Uh, every, literally every year we delay, um, every additional greenhouse gas emission that goes out there, every new fossil fuel plant that goes in, or whether it's coal or gas or oil, is going to exacerbate those impacts. And there's also a time lag in them. So, you know, we are already committed to extensively a more extreme climate change, even if we were to sort of stop today greenhouse gas emissions. So, so we really need to be prepared for this. Um, just to get back to your other question, look, it, it really does require an all of society approach. Um, and, and that's very difficult. I know that sounds very glib, but I, what I want to really say is that uh, for every person under about 20, if or whatever the official definition of youth is, I think it might be 24, is you guys need to get on the streets. You need to be getting out there. You need to be being activists. You also need to put huge pressure on every adult that you know. Um, to step up to the plate and look after your future, the youth future, because it's really, it, it, it's abandoning you by expecting one, you to solve the problem and two adults sort of uh, patronizing you saying, oh, don't worry about it, you're being alarmist and all the rest of it. And I just want to appeal to all the other adults on this right now is every one of us has a responsibility to be putting this information out there, to be communicating it, to be engaging with other aspects of civil society and making adults actually support the youth activists to become activists themselves. Every church group, every group like Rotary who are uh, international or who I've been working with and Lions and so on, everybody who has some means to contribute to this all of society activism, we need to step up to the plate. This cannot be left to any one group. This cannot be left to any one individual. And it's particularly unfair to leave youth to actually try and solve this on their own. So whilst I'm absolutely encouraging youth to do absolutely everything you possibly can because it is your futures. We adults need to step up and do much, much, much more. And that's engaging in conversations, engaging with parliamentarians, engaging with local municipal officials and getting this information out. I think, sorry, if I can just say Bill McKibben, I hope everybody on this call will know who that is, uh, founder of 350.org. He says, you know, he was an introvert. Uh, uh, he said, and, and, He's got incredibly uncomfortable becoming an activist and putting himself out there. We all need to get uncomfortable. Uh, it doesn't matter because we're gonna become very, very uncomfortable with these climate change impacts. So let's rather feel uncomfortable about solving the problems than being uncomfortable about receiving recipients of the impact. Thank you so much, Professor King. I think that is absolutely essential. And I think as much as we, we can be inspired by the youth and we can get hope from, from our youth movements, it is by no means okay for us to just hand over the baton to them. Um, uh, even for those of us who find ourselves caught between being a youth and being an old person. <laughs> um, so I, uh, on that note, I just want to draw your attention to the chat uh, where Yola's uh, contributions also, I'm posting it for those who missed some of it. Uh, so please do go and have a look there. And then we have a hand up amongst our attendees. Um, it's one of our many Nozukos. Um, maybe if you could just, I will allow you to speak and if you could uh, introduce yourself um, so first unmute yourself, then introduce yourself, and then ask your question and direct it to uh, one of our panelists. Um, comrade, I'm not sure what your name is. You have been logged in as Nozuko Pony. Uh, you have your hand up. Okay. Um, there we go. Go ahead, Com. Uh, good day. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Com. Please introduce yourself and then ask your question. Yes, I'm Sipo Okanye, the activist, environmental activist here in Newcastle. Uh, I would like to know as to how, <clears throat> as the, we, the professors and everybody, has collected a vast knowledge. Now we have a 
uh, vast knowledge available as a proof that there is indeed a problem with the environment. So I would like to check as to how far or the, the, the governments or even international governments seem to be responding to the climate change. So I want to know how, according to, if you gauge, does it, it influences the, the, the politician? Because we have the politicians, they don't understand uh, even the environment, the problem of the environment, they are just interested in other things which are not related to environment. We have a problem here because nobody understands. Now we have a, a climate change to understand that the sun is hot and making, making lives uh, unbearable. But people don't know uh, as to what that is caused by, the cause of all those things. So I'd like to know, as we are now having the professors, the information available, it, does it influence the governments or to what extent the government, more especially the government of South Africa, is influenced by all this information we are having. Thank you. Um, would any of our panelists like to, to take a shot at answering that question? It's a tricky one. Professor Engelberg. I, I can make a first attempt. Thanks. Um, and many thanks for this interesting question. What I would like to contribute as an answer is that all the governments of the world, including ours, will very, very soon be tested in terms of the latest commitments towards battling climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that is, of course, at the upcoming 26th conference of the parties in November. Now, ahead of this meeting, each country, and there are about 195 countries participating in this process, each of them had to make a new commitment through a so-called nationally determined contribution on mitigation in terms of specify what each country is committing to in terms of future greenhouse gas reductions. Now, of course, we, I think, of course, it is very, very clear that very few countries, if any, have really reached their goals in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions since the climate negotiations began, began and especially since the Paris Agreement was signed back in 2015. So the world is by far behind action. Um, now, two more things I'd like to say. One international, one international point and one national point. Inter international point, I keep changing. I think we are on the verge of a societal tipping point. And I think that during this COP26, we will see an, a, a new pact between the United Kingdom, the, the USA, Japan, South Korea, and the European Union. They will all basically say they are going to hold the emissions by 2030 and they will achieve net zero emissions by 2050. That will be the commitment. Of course, action will have to follow. But that will be a major commitment and it's going to swing investments fairly positive. Um, what China is going to do is the other big question. But about a week ago, China and I said it is no longer going to fund any coal-fired power projects abroad. That's a very big swing in China's own policy. So it seems to me as if we are heading towards this COP with a lot of momentum. Um, what about South Africa's position? So you may have noticed that cabinet has now approved our own nationally determined contribution on mitigation. Um, so I've been starting to look at the numbers, as many of you probably also have done. It seems to me that the best case scenario we are committing to is a 30% reduction in our emissions by 2030 compared to present day emissions. 
Now, the guideline science sets is that the world needs to achieve about a 50% reduction by 2030. So we are below the curve there, but we must also be very clear that achieving, even achieving a 50% reduction is going to be a major challenge for South Africa over the next 10 years. It will, for example, require very, very big changes in all our main fossil fuel companies, Eskom, Sasol, Exaro, and so forth. And I also do see in the news over the last several weeks that these companies are making more ambitious commitments than ever before. So there are also positive aspects into this, although I think maybe many people in this audience today would have liked to see an even stronger commitment. I should also point out that that's the last thing I'll say, uh, Karina, that shouldn't take too long, I guess. Um, that's the most positive as, uh, you know, side, uh, the most positive range of our commitment. Uh, our commitment, in fact, comes down to we will reduce emissions by 2030 by between 12 and 50 percent. That 12 percent, of course, I don't think that will be enough for the international community to support us in terms of investment and cheap loans and so forth. They are going to expect more from us than the lower end of our estimate of 12 percent. Okay, and the very last thing I'll say, I see the government did leave open the door in that submission to the, to the UN process. It is saying, <coughs> sorry, that maximum of 50%. Um, that's what we can achieve basically on our own initiatives. With strong international investment, maybe we can do more. So the, the door is left open for that. And um, it's, on, it's on that basis that we are now going into the COP. And by the end of the COP, I think we will be able to answer better the question we've just been posed. Thank you so much, Professor Engelbrecht. Um, we are running a bit low on time, so I think we're just going to um, move towards wrapping up. Uh, and we'd just like to give uh, the opportunity to uh, for last comments. Uh, comment, Ronald, are you still with us? Uh, I don't see Comment Ronald, uh, but Comment Promise, would you like to, to make any last comments? Uh, yeah, uh, I think for me and uh, on my side, looking into the government is that um, the government is more interested in carbon tax, not in the climate issues. And that make us have a, big, a, a very big worry on how are we going to shift uh, to save our planet. That's the only thing I can say. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Promise. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Um, Yola, I'm not sure if you're still with us, if you'd like to add any last comments. I'm not sure if we still have Yola. For those who haven't seen, please do check the chat for, for the um, written our version of Yola's contribution. Uh, you can also message us if you if you want to see it. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to our two professors. Uh, Professor Engelbrecht, any last contributions? Thank you, Karina, and thanks again for the opportunity to present today. I would say I will. Uh, I have. Um, let me give a message specifically to our younger attendees today, to the youth. I think one thing is clear. Um, the world 20 years from now will not be the world of today. Okay, the world is, all, is always changing, right? But we've never experienced climate change in, in the historical record as we are doing right now. So you are going to live through extremely challenging times, but it is also going to be in a way exciting because there are also many opportunities here. Um, I think to a large extent, the world is going to make the transition and you may well see in front of your own eyes, how South Africa transitions to a country that is very much dependent on renewable energy. 
as its main resource of electricity. That's going to be a fascinating process. It's going to create many new jobs. There will be many investments in South Africa. That's the positive side of the one positive future. So if South Africa is going to embrace the mitigation process and contribute and attract those investments, it may actually be really good for South Africa. It may, it may help us to get economic growth back on track. So let us not be completely derailed by all these dire projections, right? Like the one I've been showing. Um, at the same time, you should be alert. We, we, must, we must face the climate change challenges we are going to face in terms of climate change impacts. There's no denying the world is committed to further warming. Um, if I should make an estimation today, I, I think, unfortunately, I must tell you the truth. It is going to be extremely difficult to restrict global warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, what is very possible is that in the next 20 years, we may in fact see um, 2 degrees Celsius of global warming arriving. Very likely towards the, the middle of the century, 2 degrees Celsius or more. That's, that's absolutely under cards. So we are committed to further warming and there will be more impacts on our country in terms of agriculture, in terms of the health of people, and perhaps most importantly, big challenges in our cities in terms of water security, quality of water. Um, if, if you're an environmental scientist, you will have your work cut out over the next 20 years. The country will need you. Um, if you're an activist or a policymaker, the country will need you. So you will have much to contribute in terms of the transition, which may really be positive, and at the same time, uh, we'll have to cope with these challenges climate change will increasingly bring to the country. Thank you so much, Professor Engelbrecht. And lastly, Professor King. Yeah, Karina, just to echo Francois, uh, thank you very much for the invite. and. Uh, I'll try and keep it short. I, I do think uh, we, we need to know the reality of the situation, um, but uh, as we've tried to paint it today, that, that those are the facts. Um, but it's not doom and gloom. Those are the opportunities too. Uh, and I think for youth uh, the, is really to point out, I think the IEA, for example, said we could get about a third of the necessary greenhouse gas emissions just through energy efficiencies. So how do we achieve those energy efficiencies? There are massive opportunities for sort of entrepreneurship and experimentation and invention of energy efficiency uh, applications. The same for South Africa and water efficiencies. We still spray irrigate our water during the heat of the summer days and it's getting hot. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Huge opportunities to get uh, water, more water efficient technologies on the table. So I would just encourage everybody here, you know, get active about it, raise the, your voice, raise, uh, share the information, but also think about the solutions, the practical solutions on the, on the ground, because that's where the job opportunities are going to come in the future. They'll come around an eco-centric circular economy where there's no such thing as waste, there's no such thing as pollution. How do we ensure that that happens? It'll come with the application of technologies like renewable energy, uh, digital technologies, apps, which enable people to measure their footprints, uh, energy efficiency, water efficiency, and it'll come from a combination of those digital technologies and environmental science um, in things like catchment restoration, biodiversity restoration, expanded uh, protected areas, greening cities, uh, making environments better to live in, um, not polluting water uh, and so on. So I would just encourage everybody to get on the side of how do we fix this as opposed to how do we say, gee, how did we get into this mess? Um, and I would just say thanks again for actually bringing everybody together today. It's been a wonderful opportunity. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think, yeah, that was a wonderful kind of uh, shout out to uh, the work on the just transition that we need to do. Um, and maybe just to plug the Life After Call Just Transition Open Agenda, which I think um, I will put it in the chat now as well, but speaks to how broad we want this transition to be. And we need to really be determining what it looks like and take this matter into our own hands. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. I'm going to hand back to Lerat. Oh, thank you so much, um, Karina. Definitely. Thank you to our experts. Thank you to our community activists who are doing all that work on the ground. Um, and of course, thank you to um, everyone who joined us um, this morning. Um, it definitely has been a long talk, but a very important talk. Um, and, you know, uh, I'd like to also most important thank all our experts for actually reminding us um, that, you know, 
uh, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, these facts and figures actually do present opportunities for all of us, not just for civil society, but for all sectors and all members of society to actually get involved, to get active um, as we all continue to work towards creating a more socially just um, society for all. So with that, I'd like to thank you all and wish you all a good afternoon. Bye-bye.